episode 453 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic and sometimes satanic genre films of yesteryear. My name's Derek M. Cook, your writer, host, producer. I'd like to welcome you to Monster Kid Radio and to week two of our month-long event, The Satanic Rites of January, where we're going to be taking a look at classic genre cinema that have a devilish influence. Last week, we talked about the Val Luton film, The Seventh Victim. This week, we have got a bona fide classic from 1934, starring two titans, two icons of classic horror and just classic cinema in general, if you ask me, Karloff and Lugosi in The Black Cat. Now, this ladies and gentlemen this is a film it's a great film and i cannot wait to talk to well a great person about it this week's guest coming in from of all places disney indiana to talk about this dark movie is scott morris scott is my partner at plan nine by nine he has been my partner and co-producer co-host on things like the 1951 down place podcast r.i.p for now and he's been here on the show numerous times, and I'm sure he's going to be on the show numerous times again in the future. Anyway, he was in town not too long ago, so he and I set up the microphones, sat down, talked about the black cat. Word of warning. 2019 was not content with all the blows that it dealt everybody last year. It wanted to deal me one more blow. And that was wrecking my microphone. Um, I know it's kind of a small thing in the grand scheme of things, but... Because I didn't catch it until about halfway through the recording session, sometimes the audio on my end doesn't sound as clear as it normally would. My apologies for that. I did what I could to make it sound as passable as possible. I still think it's a great conversation. And, well, I mean, you're here for the guests, not for me. You're here for the movie conversation, not crystal clear audio, although I do my best. So my apologies in advance for any muffled or scratchy audio you hear in the discussion about the black cat. What is coming in crystal clear, however, is the song Hornado from the band Mariachi Death Squad. They're a band based out of Edinburgh in the UK. You can find Mariachi Death Squad at mariachideathsquad.bandcamp.com. They gave us permission to play their music here on the show, and you'll be hearing this song Hornado in its entirety at the end of this episode as well. If you want to hop over to their Bandcamp page, just look up the album you've been hit by. And there it is. Warnado's right there waiting for you. Of course, do that after you're done listening to this episode of Monster Kid Radio, because I don't want you to miss out on the conversation about the black cat, a little bit of other business I have to talk about, and Kenny's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, and Professor Frenzy's bedtime story. Why don't we go ahead and tackle some of the business up front, though, before we get on with the rest of the show. I am excited because the Rondo Awards, the Rondo Awards have opened up themselves for nomination suggestions. Head over to RondoAward.com to learn everything you need to know about the Rondo Awards. The Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards is an annual event. It's an annual award program honoring the best in classic horror research creativity and film preservation. It's real easy to make nominations. You just have to email them at taraco at aol.com. That is spelled T as in Tom, A-R-A-C-O at aol.com. And just let them know what you'd like to see listed as maybe best movie, best short film, best independent film, best documentary, best book, monster kid of the year, favorite horror host, Best Multimedia, which is where Monster Kid Radio would fall if you're looking to nominate anybody, just saying. And you can also make nominations for Monster Kid of the Year. Did I already say that? I might have. But Monster Kid of the Year and the Monster Kid Hall of Fame. Again, head over to RondoAward.com for more details, more information, or just go over to the Classic Horror Film Board, which you can get to at ClassicHorrorFilmBoard.com and look for the Rondo Award topic in the forums over there. It's a great message board. If you're not registered at the Classic Horror Film Board, you're missing out. There are some great conversations happening about all kinds of classic monster movies at the Classic Horror Film Board. Of course, there will be links in the show notes. I'd also like to give a very special shout out to a listener of the show, Simone, which is listener Kurt McCoy's Black Cat. He posted on Facebook the other day that apparently Simone loves listening to the podcast. So, hi, Simone. Say hi to Kurt for me, and hey, if Renfield wants to cuddle up and listen to Monster Kid Radio too, y- y- 
you gotta share. There's enough Monster Kid Radio to go around. And finally, big thanks to the organizers of Fandom PDX. Last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, January 4th and 5th, was Fandom PDX here in Portland, Oregon. And Monster Kid Radio and myself were guests. We were listed as talent on the website. We had a panel that we did. It was... A really good time. I was wondering how Monster Kid Radio was going to fit in the Fandom PDX crowd. Fandom PDX seems to cater a lot toward like the anime, manga, cosplay audiences. And we don't do anime or manga and cosplay here on Monster Kid Radio. Unless you count dressing up for Halloween as cosplay. And I know some of you guys and gals cosplay. You've sent me pictures. But anyway, I felt like Monster Kid Radio might have sticking out like a sore monster thumb at the con. But that was not the case at all. The panel was called Classic Science Fiction for Modern Audiences, and I was joined by Monster Kid Radio Irregulars, Chris McMillan from The Shadow Over Portland and David Heath from the DUGS podcast and Dave's Corner of the Universe. Thank you to Chris and David for being part of the show last weekend and joining me at that panel and if there are any new listeners anybody that we found at the panel if you're listening right now thank you for discovering monster kid radio and giving the show a shot thank you for being part of the audience when we did the panel and yeah i did try to record that panel as well so later on this year depending on how the audio turned out because i did try to do something a little bit differently so i didn't have the same problems that i had when i recorded the roger corman thing (gasps) if that audio turned out okay you'll be hearing it on a future episode of monster kid radio okay Let's go ahead and get into the rest of the show. We got Professor Frenzy waiting in the wings to tell us a bedtime story. Then Kenny in Famous Monsters of Filmland. And then Scott Morris, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, and me. All of that right after this. This man is a killer, mad with dreams of fantastic power. We're conducting experiments requiring fissionable materials. That's atom bomb stuff. The government has that locked up tighter than Fort Knox. You work for us faithfully or you'll be turned over to the authorities. I understand there's a reward of $5,000 on your head. No money is safe. No man is safe. Nothing stops the amazing transparent man. Into army guarded secret government vaults he goes, stealing confidential nuclear material, holding in his unseen hands the key to world power. But the amazing transparent man wants first vengeance. If I choke you hard enough, you'll bring me back. Good evening, Monster Kid. This is the Count. I'm here with some friends to tell you about our favorite board and card game podcast. It's Go Forth and Game. Tom and Ryan talk about all things gaming with special emphasis on interviews with game designers and publishers. What do you think about this, my tall, gaunt friend? Go Forth Game! Good. And what about you, my undead comrade? I think Go Forth and Game is the most entertaining podcast about board and card games that I've come across in 4,522 years. So, if you enjoy listening to two monster kids discuss topics like abstract games, the best family games, game schooling, various game mechanics, and of course, monster-themed games, then you should give Go Forth and Game a try. That's GoForthAndGame.com, available on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, 
Professor Frenze, it's a show. Professor Frenze, show. Professor Frenze, it's a show. Professor Frenze, show. Welcome to Professor Frenzy's Bedtime Stories, created especially for Monster Kid Radio. My name is Jerry Green. In this segment, I'm going to tell you a story from EC Horror Comics. Today's story is The Living Mummy. It's from The Haunt of Fear, number four, the November-December issue from 1950. It was written by Bill Gaines and Al Feldstein, and the art was by Jack Davis. So sit back and relax while I tell this comedic story. Once upon a time, in a mysterious castle up at the top of a mountain, was the laboratory of Professor Arnold Zamron. He had two assistants, Kraus and Stevens. The two assistants bickered constantly, and Zamron had no respect for Stevens. He always sided with the brutal Kraus. After the pair argued over a woman, Zamron told them to get back to work. They were trying to raise an Egyptian mummy from the dead. The team brought their machinery to life, but Zamron was crushed that their attempt at this resurrection failed. Stevens redid the math and suggested what they needed was to increase the voltage to the maximum. Zamron poo-pooed his suggestion and retreated to his private study to do the numbers. Undeterred, Stevens decided to try it his way. He reran the experiment, but with the new voltage. Even so, the mummy didn't come to life. Stephen retreated into his bedroom. While he was in his room, the mummy sprang to life. The ancient corpse rose and trashed the labs, like you do. Krauss came upon the mess and at first blamed Stevens. He realized his mistake too late as the mummy attacked him. In his private study, Zamron realized that Stevens' suggestion was correct. No worries, he would just take credit for it anyway. Then he heard a horrible cry from down in the lab and raced to punish his wayward assistants. He found Kraus dead and the laboratory in ruins. Stevens must have done it. He got a gun and went to Stevens' room and threatened him. Stevens says he was asleep and when he left the lab, everything was fine. He did confess to rerunning the experiment. It must have worked. The mummy must be alive. Suddenly they heard a thumping noise. Zamron tried to tie Stevens up to keep him on ice for the police, but Stevens was having none of it. He disarmed the doctor and ran out of the castle. Sadly, he ran himself right off a cliff. Zamron went to phone the police. He realized that with both of his assistants dead, he would be able to take all the credit for bringing the mummy to life. But before he could get through to the authorities, the mummy entered his study. He shot the creature, but it was no use. Long, dead hands wrapped around his neck. The end. I hope you enjoyed that creepy tale. This was a pretty straightforward story. Experiment failed, then succeeded. Then three dead in quick succession. The addition of the fame-hungry doctor and the fighting assistants did give much-needed color to the piece. There was some threat and tension even without the mummy. Jack Davis really knows his way around a horror story. The three scientists all look unique. The balding, mustachioed Zamron, brutish Kraus, and bookish Stevens. All were very clear. The mummy, too, was a gross skull under all those wrappings. Very cool. I like this one. If you're interested in a copy of The Haunt of Fear, Volume 1, the book can be purchased on Amazon, and you can find a link to buy it on the MKR website. I hope you enjoyed the story. My name is Jerry Green, and you can listen to my podcast on the Frenzy feed. On Wednesday, we have the Professor Frenzy show where we talk about new indie comics. And on Monday, we have Memory Minute Monday, a nostalgia podcast. And on Sunday, listen to Frenzy Peace Theater where we recap and discuss classic comic book stories. You can also catch me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy. And search for Professor Frenzy on YouTube where you can find the Professor Frenzy show and some exciting projects we have coming up. Stay tuned and thanks for listening. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy, show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy. How much shock can you take? <laughs> it will haunt you forever. From the depths of evil comes the diabolic killer of beautiful women, the vampire's coffin.
me a vampire's body stolen from its tomb. A psycho killer removes the stake so the vampire can again prey on beautiful women. It's in the vampire's coffin. And to complete a double night of horror, a monster's nightmare of terror turned loose in a fight to the death. The robot versus the Aztec mummy. They will bring you a night of terror. We dare you to see them, but don't come alone. The Vampire Coffin in an all-new double horrorama show with The Robot versus the Aztec Mummy. Presented in Hypnoscope. The height and the horror. Shock your senses. Chill your brain. It could only be shown at midnight. Blood of the ever-living, the ever-evil. Blood from the mummy's tomb. From the dead, dead past come powers too terrifying, too strange to be believed. You know who I am? Yes. And you're afraid, aren't you? Who is she, wearing the mummy's face? Is she one of us, enjoying our kind of life? Or is she the ever-living, the ever-evil? <coughs> Blood from the Mummy's Tomb. Rated PG. Have you heard? Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story. Either a whole short story or a novel, a chapter or two at a time. Join us for our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu mythos at the end of the month. Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Black Clock Audio Tales. Part of darkmyths.org. Thank you. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. This week's movie, The Black Cat, was first mentioned at length in FM 47 in a preview article of a new version of The Black Cat that was being released in late 1967. It was part of a history of Black Cat-based movies. Here is what it had to say. Then, in 1934, Universal Pictures picked Poe's perpetually popular chill tale to co-star Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. The new plot presented Lugosi as the victim of devil worshipper and arch-villain Karloff, who had stolen Lugosi's wife and daughter years before. The wife's remains are now preserved in Karloff's weird mansion, and the wrong Lugosi, in a non-villainous role, returns for revenge. In England, the film was mutilated by the touchy censors of the 30s, making the cat angle vague. But the suggestion was meant to be that the spirit of Lugosi's dead wife had passed into a cat, and that when Lugosi unwittingly killed the cat out of a mortal dread of the animal, he destroyed his wife anew. In the 34 Black Cat, Lugosi did have a terrible revenge on Carla, but at no time did the cat reveal a murderer and, despite the credits, Poe's plot was barely used. Karloff smiled when he and I recalled the film together in recent times, and he commented, the things we did to Poe when he wasn't around to defend himself. Famous Monster 67 from July of 1970 featured a black cat film book, a 15-page synopsis featuring 16 photos. It was later reprinted in two parts in FM's 134 and 135. 
Let's look at some excerpts of this detailed look at this classic. First, a famous scene where we meet Bella's character. The bitterness and sadness in his voice made Allison ashamed of having glared at him so threateningly. There was another spell of silence, and then the mysterious stranger went on speaking. Have you ever heard of Krugal? It was a Russian military prison in Siberia. Even after the war had finished, the men in it were not released for many years. That is, those of them who survived the horrors of its dark dungeons. They were forgotten amid the throes of the Russian Revolution and the resulting unrest. No order for their release came through for a long time. A long time. He paused, and on resuming, it was as if he had forgotten the presence of his listeners. Many men went to Kurgau, he breathed, and few have returned. But I have returned. After 15 years, I have returned. He gazed into space, and to the Allisons, the glitter in his eyes seemed all at once to become dangerous, vengeful, tainted with a streak of madness. The young couple looked at each other uneasily. Here is the introduction of Karloff's character in Chapter 4, The Satanist. As Vertigas finished talking, the door opened slowly and, glancing around, Vertigas and Peter Allison saw a tall man cross the threshold, a man who gave an impression of slyness, his eyes strangely compelling as if all the strength of his character were focused there in a subtle contradiction of his otherwise shifty manner. Peter Allison had originally sensed a certain uncanniness about Vertigast when he first met the doctor on the train. He experienced that same feeling on setting eyes on this man, but it was much more acute. At the same time, he realized that, although Vertigast had claimed to be visiting an old friend, there was no friendliness in the glance, which now passed between these two men, only a chilling, latent hostility. It has been a long time, jean Polzeg said Vertigast with a queer intake of his breath. The years have been kind to you, you have not changed a great deal. And here is how the creepy presentation of Vertigas' wife was described in Chapter 7, The Living Dead. My wife, Polzig, why don't you take me to her? Vertigas demanded. For answer, the monster of Marmaros stepped over to the wall and his hand touched a hidden spring. Instantly, a panel slid aside to reveal a niche in the stonework, a niche which had been covered by Polzig with plate glass. Behind that transparent sheet stood a kind of sarcophagus in an upright position, and within the coffin was the body of the doctor's wife. She was richly gowned in a strange medieval costume, and as young as when he had last seen her 18 years ago. If only those silent lips could have spoken, if only those sightless eyes could have turned towards him with the look of tenderness which he had once known in them. But she was dead, and beautiful as she was, there was something horrifying in seeing her like this, embalmed within these grim walls. You see, Vitus, I have cared for her tenderly and well, came the low, deliberate voice of Polzig. She died a few years after the war, of pneumonia. She was never very strong, you know. Is she not beautiful? I wanted to keep her beauty for all time. I loved her too, Vitus. The synopsis continues with equal detail to the thrilling conclusion. No comments, no production notes, just the story. And for many monster kids in those days, that was enough, as it was often the only way to know what this great film was about. It was hard to see. My first viewing was deep into my adulthood, sometime in the 90s. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next time. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. <laughs>
make it a stake and drive it through my heart and bury me beside my father. Well, do it! Do I have to kill myself? If you love me, please kill me! Vampires, werewolves, zombies. Yes, these things are real, but fortunately for those of us who can afford him, so is Mark Temple. And he's good. Real good. He's a former FBI agent turned freelancer with the knowledge and skills to eliminate your monster problems. And his rates are negotiable. Monster Hunter for Hire, the first volume of the Supernatural Solutions, the Mark Temple Case Files, is now available in both ebook and paperback. Go to tinyurl.com slash monsterhuntertemple to buy your copy of Derek M. Cook's latest book. Read about Mark Temple, the experienced professional now available to rid you of your supernatural, ghoulish, and monstrous pests. That's tinyurl.com slash monsterhuntertemple. And don't worry, Mark Temple is discreet. This is Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned. And don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. When I think satanic, I think Scott Morris. Disney is very satanic. You know, I think if you look at it, um, you might find... I'm sure there's somebody out there who's said that Disney is... You know what? (laughs) I'm not even going to say take two. We're using this. It's Monster Kid Radio. It's Scott Morris from Disney, Indiana. Week two of the Satanic Rites of January. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you this morning? I don't know yet. I'm still just now waking up. I overslept. It is New Year's Day. We stayed up uh, last night to bring in the new year. Scott and Tracy Morris were actually here in town and uh, we, we wanted to hold on to 2019 as long as we could. So we moved out west. Why I did that, I don't know. I yeah. did not have a good 2019. <laughs> I was like, 2019, there, there were like maybe like, I, I don't know, man. There, there, was, there was a rough year. There was some stuff that you the went through. The first half was good. You went through some stuff. No, I went man. through some stuff, yes. No satanic rites, though. No, Well, see, maybe that was the problem. Maybe. Not enough of it. <laughs> man. Okay, so it is New Year's Day. It's just barely after 12, something or other. I have been awake for maybe half an hour tops. Scott's been up and running for a little while, uh, waiting for me to get myself out of bed so we can record about this film. And which film is this film? This film is the 1934 classic film, probably one of the best non specific monster universal film from the era of the classic, uh, well, monster films. I guess. I don't know where I'm going. It's the black cat. It's the black cat. <laughs> Uh, with Lugosi, Karloff, 
David Manners, some other people, directed by Edgar G. Ulmer, and it's phenomenal. Now, I know a lot of people wanted to talk about the Black Cat with me here on the show, and maybe not this February, but next February or February down the line when we do another flashback month, we can have other people come on and talk about the Black Cat. But I've been sitting on this film for a very long time because Scott saw it for the first time at a Monster Bash, and when he came out of the screening, he was a ch- he looked like a changed man. I was blown away when I first saw it. So that was the very first time that I saw it. Like like Derek said, at Monster Bash, uh, it was an actual print. It was amazing. It was a print. It wasn't a... Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't see it. I was doing Monster Kid Radio business. And it was introduced by Gregory William Mank, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And he probably talked a little bit about it. Yes, he did. And he's actually on the uh, Blu-ray that we watched as well. Yeah, so for my... For my Christmas. No, I was it's for Christmas. I was going to say my birthday because it's so close. For Christmas, my mother, uh, who's awesome, sent me the Universal Monsters Classics Volume 1 Classics something. From uh, Scream Factory. Yes, yeah, that one collection. And the Black Cat's on there. And Scott and I watched that the other day. I think the transfer looks amazing. It looks really good. Sounds great. Mank is on there, as well as Gary D. Rhodes talking a little bit. If I wouldn't say they were going back and forth like a versus situation, but Rhodes being the Lugosi scholar. Mank, you know, knowing mo- about both, but really being more of a Karloff kind of guy. It was kind of see- cool to see the two of them talking a little bit uh, about the film as well. It's really nice Blu-ray. I don't have it myself, but that might be something that I'm going to correct soon because oh, I'd I love imagine. to have a good copy yeah, of it. I, I imagine. Uh, it, it's something that I think most monster kids need to get their hands on. I haven't broken into any of the other movies on that collection. My mother also got me Volume 2, and I haven't looked at any of those. I think Murders in the Zoo is on one of them, which I'm really excited to see how that looks. But Universal, you're killing me, man. Put the Jungle Woman movies out. I'm blue. Come on. I'm just saying, you know, I'm going to ride that one for a long time. But the Black Cat looked great. Maybe I should just wait till Disney buys them. They're buying everything else. Oh, man. Yeah, we, we talked a little <laughs> bit about that, too. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but speaking of which, you know what? This is the first episode after Christmas. So about a little bit of Christmas debrief here. One thing that Scott and Tracy gave me for Christmas? Yeah, it was Christmas. It was the Blu-ray. The Scarecrow yes. of... Romney Marsh. Romney Marsh Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah. Which we have talked about here on the sh- No, we didn't. I'm all over the place. No, as in, we have talked about it together, but not on this show. Yeah, we, we used to do a different podcast that maybe someday we'll come back. That Hammer Films thing. It wasn't on that show either. No, we talked about <laughs> uh, Night Creatures, Captain Clegg which was the Hammer version of the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh story, the Dr. Sin story. And then we did a crossover with Disney Indiana where we talked about the Disney version of the story. And I'm excited to check out the blue. Uh, it's from that exclusive Disney movie club yes, thing, right? Yes, movie club, yep. On Down Place, we were joined by my wife, Tracy, and of course our uh, former co-host, Casey, not his kidney stone, actual Casey. Yeah, I don't think the kidney stone was around at that point. It was being generated. Ah. And then all four of us uh, uh, were on both both of those two podcasts. That was fun. And I'm eager to, like I said, check out The Blue. I know when we watched it for Disney Indiana, it hadn't had like an official blu-ray release it had been released on disc at one point didn't it it was released on a walt disney treasures uh set which is multiple discs including the film itself plus a lot of behind the scenes stuff it's one they put out very limited edition and quickly uh, sold out and it's triple digits now if you want to try to get one on the secondary market Now, the Blu-ray doesn't look like it's got much, it's just bare bones, but I'm still looking forward to the up conversion that may or may not have happened when it was transferred to Blue. Should be a good good watch. Uh, Speaking of Disney and all that, though, we talked a little bit about Disney Plus while you were here. We checked out Disney Plus. Looks like there's some monster-like movies available there that maybe we'll be doing some crossovers down the line. Maybe, maybe. Uh, We did watch some Disney Plus while we were out here. We did. We did. We explored that, and that was... That was cool. I I don't know if it's something that I'm going to add to my collection or my streaming services right away because I kind of saw everything I need to see right now with The Mandalorian. (laughs) It's a whole different conversation uh, down the line. But 
Yeah, you know, I don't mind teasing it a little bit. We'll do some Disney content. I really want to look at the black hole with you. Mm-hmm. We'll do a crossover oh, yes. if you guys are up for that. I've been really obsessing over Blackbeard's ghost lately, and I don't know why. I guess I saw it a bunch as a kid, and it's been thinking about it a lot lately. It's it's a monster like it's a ghost movie. Yep, yep. There's a handful of things out there we could talk about on, on MKR and Disney Indiana if you are up for future collaborations. The Mr. Boogity. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I love me some Mr. Boogity, man. <laughs> Boogity boogity boo. Oh, yeah. Have some very, um, I have some stories to tell about that when we get to it. But this is someday. These episodes may show up here. They may show up on Disney Indiana. Scott and I may just show up at your house, knock on your door, come in and talk about it in your living room in front of you. You, you know, it, make sure you have snacks and sodas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> we, maybe we'll give you like half an hour notice so you can like straighten up or whatever. Yeah. But. Cause you got to have the diet do. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right the diet mountain dew is a staple around here these days. anyway what are we talking about we're talking about uh more the old Christmas. dark house the, the old dark what <laughs> no <laughs> before we get to the black cat i also want to talk about something that scott and tracy gave me for my birthday a few weeks back that we broke out and played a couple of rounds of last night waiting for the ball to drop uh that was the board game horrified the officially licensed which I was surprised when I heard that when it first came out. The officially licensed game, Horrified. Officially licensed from Universal because it features the Universal monsters. You don't see Lugosi. You don't necessarily see Karloff or Lanchester or even Cheney, although you do see the official monster designs. And you see Abbott and Costello. Yes, which is very <laughs> cool. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. I knew that it had the official monsters, the Invisible Man, the Creature, Dracula, Frankenstein, Bride, Wolfman. Uh, the mummy, is that all of them? I believe so. Yeah. But the villager characters, which are part of the game, you're trying to escort them to safety when they decide to show up in the middle of the street when monsters are about, boneheads. Uh, you've got Maria, you've got Maliva, there's um, an Elizabeth, a couple of doctors from Creature from the Black Lagoon, like Dr. Reed. No, okay. But, you know, she knows better yep. than to wander out. But Wilbur and Chick, man. Which was awesome to find oh, out. Oh, man, that was so cool. I, yeah, I liked that a lot. Fritz is there, uh, but yeah, I think the, the biggest missing character would be either Kay or Igor. That's no true. Igor. No Igor. Well, there is a Renfield. There is a Renfield running For around. For those of you that couldn't hear, my wife from the other room yelled Renfield. Yeah, she's, she's uh, in the peanut gallery waving at us right now. <laughs> Anyway, I really liked Horrified. I recommend it for Monster Kid Radio listeners. It seems a lot more complicated to learn than it really is. I'll make sure there is a link in the show notes, the Amazon affiliate buttons, to order your own copy if it's available on Amazon right now. If not, pop on down to Target or wherever else you buy your games and pick it up because, uh, yeah, it gets Monster Kid Radio seal of approval. The most interesting thing I thought about the game is the way that it's designed most games, the people sitting around the table playing it are playing against each other. This is not the case with this game. You guys are playing against the monsters. And you can actually play this game by yourself or with seven friends, which is kind of a neat way to design the game. Yeah, it's smartly designed. I think it's a mechanic that I've seen in other games where you're able to just play against the game itself if you just want to play a one-player game, but it's definitely a lot of fun with other people because it's the co-op nature of it. It kind of speaks to the role-playing game person in me where you're kind of cooperatively trying to solve something or beat something. We're all working together, plotting, strategizing. How are we going to take down Dracula? How are we going to keep the Wolfman from going after Tracy? Because the Wolfman really liked Tracy last night. He and I have that in common. Well, you know. But yeah, no, it was a lot of fun, and I'm grateful for it. Thank you for getting it for me for my birthday, and I imagine it's something I'm going to be playing quite a bit of, if nothing else, by myself for a long time. Mm. Scott and Tracy also got me the uh, recent book about Star Trek, the animated series. Been a very big Star Trek kick lately, and I imagine that's going to be one of the themes of 2020. Just loving me some classic Trek, and the animated Trek, I think, is underrated. Uh, there will be some Star Trek stuff happening at Monster Kid Radio this year at some point, so stay tuned for that. 
which is a book that Derek actually got me for my birthday, <laughs> which was supposed to be for Christmas, but my birthday and Christmas aren't that far apart, and it got accidentally opened early. And it's it's very good, and uh, we returned the favor for Christmas. So stay tuned for that. If you want more Star Trek content, drop me a line on Facebook or whatever, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do some more Trek this year. Got something brewing with at least a couple of people. And I'm not one of them. Not yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think my wife is, though. She's, yeah, yeah, that's something else completely not what I was thinking about. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Yep, We got all sorts of stuff in the works. All sorts of stuff in the works. 2020 could be a pretty awesome year for <laughs> Monster Kid Radio if everything works out the way that I want it to. Well, speaking of upcoming Monster Kid Radio, I will be returning in for that mm -hmm. pre-mentioned flashback February. That's right. Scott right now is the only person who is a fish, officially, officially, <laughs> You're a fish. You're <laughs> officially booked for Flashback February because Scott will be coming back uh, in about a month or so uh, to talk about Abbott and Casella meet Frankenstein, speaking of Wilbur and Jack. I was going to say, it's something we've already mentioned exactly. in this episode. <laughs> exactly. All right. So people are not here to hear us talk about our Christmas haul. Uh, people are here to talk about the Black Cat or hear us talk about the Black Cat. But before we do that, you know, we got, we got, we got to do it. Got to do it. I got the cards. Got the classic five, baby. We're going to do a round of the Classic Five for people who don't know, although at this point I imagine everybody does who's listening to the show. Unless this is your first time, welcome. The Monster Kid Radio Classic Five game is a game that we play with everybody that comes on the show, whether they're a first-timer or an old vet like Scott. Not your old part, just that. Well, I am old. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing funny about it. Anyway, uh, the math, man, I'm all over the place. The Classic Five. It's a game that we play. It's a deck of cards. Each card has a this or that. Which movie do you prefer style question? There are no wrong or right answers. It's just a way for Monster Kids to talk about like one of their challenge. favorite things. It sounds like a challenge. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> wrong. Uh, you tried to do that at Monster Bash, if I remember correctly. I tried to answer the same thing for everything. Well, <laughs> I, I do remember this. Anyway. You ready to play the Classic Five, Scott? Sure. All right, here we go. Card number one right off the top. What classic monster movie do you want to see turned into a theme park attraction? I think you actually probably came up with this card. Uh, yes, it? that sounds like one that I would have come up with. What classic that isn't already one? Because I know that there is some. There's the, the Mummies at Universal, The right? Mummies at Universal. Which It's more on the Brendan Fraser yeah. mummy than the classic mummy and there's also you see the psycho house there so it's not really an attraction but you see it do they not have you walk into it i thought you no. could walk into it no um it, you, you're on the tram ride and you see uh, the bates motel and sometimes they actually have mr bates out there shoving a body into a trunk <laughs> really <laughs> Okay. So you, you do see Norman, but what would I like to see? I'm thinking we need a creature water ride. Creature water ride. Okay. So like, like a, like a log ride. Log kind of plume thing? type of ride. I mean, it would be the complete opposite of, you know, zippity doo die. Everything's great. Uh, you're now <laughs> going to be diving down into the black lagoon where you may or may not come back. <laughs> Now I want to see a creature from the Black Lagoon skin over the Splash Mountain ride. I, I don't know how it would work. <laughs> I don't know what music you'd... There'd be no sing-along. There'd just be a lot of... Ba, 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 Every time you go around a car... Ba, ba, ba. Exactly. <laughs> and one time it would be uh, Godzilla showing up. <laughs> Which is funny you say that because while you were thinking here, I'm kind of looking off into the distance and I see my Godzilla figure up there and I'm thinking, man, a Godzilla theme park attraction would be awesome. Which uh, I have actually seen a couple of presentations for Japanese theme parks for a Godzilla ride. Nothing's ever been built. Isn't there something there, though, where it's like you walk into or you go into Godzilla's open mouth? I thought I saw something. Well, there's the Godzilla Hotel. There's the Godzilla Hotel. Man, I want to go to that so bad. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know of one where you walk into his mouth, but it might be something I'm just not aware of. I know we have a handful of listeners who went to Japan last year, huh? Uh, yeah. Not yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. 
uh, Brian Clark being one of them. Uh, was there any Godzilla stuff, theme park stuff over there, man? Let me know. All right, card number two, I would normally pull it here, but this one's got the Universal logo on it, and I'm talking Universal stuff, so I'm feeling universally. Uh, favorite George Wagner film, Man Made Monster or The Wolfman? Uh, it's kind of a given for almost everybody who gets this card. Yeah, it's got to be The Wolfman. I love that film. Seven jugular. Is that the way Jenny Williams was killed? Yes. Find something? Animal tracks. Whoever is beaten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. Oh, don't hand me that. You're just wasting your time. The wolf beat you, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. You wouldn't want to run away with a murderer, would you? Oh, Larry, you're not. You know you're not. I killed Bela. I killed Richardson. If I stay here any longer, you can't tell who'll be next. That was one of my favorites, because I saw the uh, standard Universal Classics all in one weekend at the Artcraft Theater. Oh, that's right. And the Wolfman was... Seeing that on the big screen for the first time was amazing. So I've got to go with the Wolfman. Have you seen Man Made Monster? I don't think so. I'd recommend it. It's it's Lon Chaney uh, before the Wolfman, so it's it's kind of like his trial run at Universal, I suppose. Right, number three, if you could be on set during the production of a classic Universal monster movie, which one would it be? For me, it's Creature, because I want to hang out with Julie Adams yeah. in that <laughs> bikini. You know, it's not really a bikini, but you know. For me, it's got to be the Invisible Man, because I, really? would, I would love to see how they pulled off some of the shots. Oh, wow. Okay. I would love to see the behind the scenes of what went in to create um, the fact that he wasn't there, but he was there type of thing when he was pulling off the bandages and stuff. I'd love to see that in person. Well, that, and I know that you are like the president of the Una O'Connor fan club. Oh, I am. And you'd want to hang out with her. You ought to read my slash fiction about her. No, you <laughs> should not. <laughs> Card number four, what's your favorite, moving on, what's your favorite Vincent Price film? <laughs> my favorite Vincent Price film, The Great Mouse Detective. Well, there is some one that doesn't come up very often here. I haven't seen that, I think, since it was in the theater. Because it's got Price. Does he sing in that? I can't remember. Does Radican sing? I don't remember. It's been a while since I've seen it. And I, I just mentioned that because it's a Disney film. Mm -hmm. But what one do I... My favorite that he does... I whew, I really like The Tingler, which I'm sure comes up quite a bit. I can't, I can't think of one I don't like that I've seen. He's really good in everything. Edward Scissorhands, would that be up there for you? I've never watched that. Really? You're a huge Tim Burton fan. Yeah, I know, and I have never watched that film. So all of them is the answer. <laughs> yes, okay. but I'm gonna, uh, for, for the purpose of this question, I'm going to go with The Great Mouse Detective. Fair enough. All right, uh, final card. Oh, this is this Universal? Hmm, it's part of the standard deck. Dr. Pretorius from Bride of Frankenstein or Dr. Gustav Niemann, as played by Karloff, in House of Frankenstein. Pretorius. I mean, that man is amazing. Oh, yeah. He's he's my favorite part of that entire film. I Bride is one of my favorites of the classics, and it's because of him. It's not because of the monster or anything. It's not because of, it's, it's it's him. He is so good in that film. Such an underrated character that deserves his own film. Oh yeah. I uh, would love to see a prequel to Bride, seeing what he was up to leading up to that. and Watching him make those little oh, creatures. The yeah, the Himanukli or yeah. Himanukli. The little dudes. Little dudes, yes. <laughs> and and him battling with the the king trying to get to the queen all the time. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. I, Dr. Pretorius is a kick, man. Uh, Ernest Thesiger, I don't know much about him as an actor, but... You mentioned the old Dark House kind of jokingly earlier. Yeah. Have you seen the 1930s yes. old Dark House? Yes. I know we saw the... The Hammer version or with yeah. uh, Tom Poston. But I think it, I yeah. think it would be really good to see him creating the, the, the little people. I can see some some really scary uh, failures. And then he you could bring in the king and the queen for some comic relief to uh, relieve some of the pressure that that would create. I think there's something there. I, I think so, too. And... Dark Horse Comics put out this series of novels about 10 years ago or so. 
where um, they licensed the classic monsters, and each monster had his own novel. Uh, Frankenstein, I forget the name of the Frankenstein novel, but he basically, the monster, met Jack the Ripper. I think Dracula's book was called Dracula Asylum, and it took place during World War, World War II. Uh, there was a Creature from the Black Lagoon novel that was a science fiction time travel story. There was a Wolfman story, I think it was called Hunter's Moon, and it was like a cult of the wolf bringing the Wolfman back to do stuff. The Bride of Frankenstein novel was called Pandora's Box, I believe, and Dr. Pretorius is a major character in it. And the, the premise of these novels is that they all took place after the film, kind of continuing the story. And with this one, it was about the bride surviving the explosion and trying to get away from Dr. Pretorius, who was trying to get her, coming after her. And it was the bride and a bunch of the little humanoculi uh, trying to get away. And there was a mermaid uh, humanoculi, and I think there was, uh, was the king and queen in there? It was, a hand, it was like a menagerie of little people that Pretorius had been creating, and they're trying to get away from Pretorius. It might be humunculi, the little dudes, the little guys. Humunculi. Yeah. The is Where I'm going with this is that there has been a story with Pretorius. The novels themselves weren't phenomenal. I, I wouldn't say go out and get them if you have to pay more than a buck or two for them. But it was interesting to see Pretorius turn back up again mm -hmm. with, those, with those little creatures. And I would love to see like how he made them because it's not just science. There's alchemy involved. There's some weird stuff happening. And I'd love to see explored more. I would love to see him with some early failures. I yeah. think that could be scary. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the classic five. You feel warmed up? Ready to do uh, a proper discussion about this proper film. <laughs> as long as you don't make me read Latin. Yeah, the Latin. The Latin and the Black Cat when Karloff is conducting a satanic rite. According to the Internet Movie Database. Oh, do you have it there? Yeah, you have I the have translation? It you yes. want to read the translation? With a grain of salt, a brave man may fall, but he cannot yield. To err is human. The wolf may change his skin, but not his nature. Truth is mighty and will prevail. External actions show internal secrets. Remember, when a life's path is steep, to keep your mind even. The loss is not known is no loss at all. Heavy thunder, with a grain of salt, a brave man may fall, but he cannot yield. By fruit, not by leaves, judge a tree. Every madman thinks everybody mad. Who repents from sinning is almost innocent. With a grain of salt. <laughs> they have it here in Latin, too, and I could have tried to, but I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I don't want to have to edit around that. <laughs> There's a sense to me that some of the quote-unquote satanic elements in this were just kind of tossed in for flavor. The satanic content, the Latin, that's not why we're talking. I mean, it is why we're talking about this movie. The reason we talk about this movie now is because of Karloff and Lugosi's performance. It is the first time they collaborated. From the beginning, you can tell where Universal's really kind of thought their bread was buttered with giving Karloff top billing. He's just Karloff. Mm -hmm. And then Bela Lugosi is beneath him with Bela getting second billing, at least second billing. He's not just a last name. He is you know, just another dude in the film. And it's too bad because I think Lugosi does a really good job in this movie. Really good. Oh, they both hold their own, especially this, their scenes together. Oh, man. Are just incredible. Yeah, they're not playing their monsters. But this is a really good example of Universal picking out some of their highlights and putting them in a film together. Really giving them an opportunity to show what they can do acting wise. Mm -hmm. There's a lot on display here, even though it's really early in both of their run as horror icons, man, they're doing some pretty horrific things and they're doing it so well and they're still acting their hearts out and playing off each other so well. And you can Chemistry. tell that they, they have the chemistry and 
the impression that they don't like each other is palpable. In Amazing. real life, they like each other, but these characters don't like each other. Yeah, and that's something that I think gets blown way out of proportion, the, the so-called rivalry between the two. I think Karloff eventually started feeling sorry for Lugosi and maybe didn't approve of some of the things Lugosi said or did, but as professional actors, I feel like they both respected each other, and I don't know, I just there's something really special about this film. They're playing opposite their typecasting, I suppose, uh, especially with Lugosi. Oh, definitely, because I remember the first time I when I saw this at Monster Bash, Lugosi I'd seen Dracula and, and everything that I'd really seen him in, save um, Ed Wood. He was always a bad guy. He was always a villain, and he's actually kind of sympathetic in this film. You kind of root for him, well, and which is something that really caught me off guard watching this for the first time. Because I just, as soon as he came on screen, I'm like, okay, he's the bad guy. But he wasn't. He always has this kind of edge to him throughout the film that you know there's something in him that is capable of doing some pretty despicable things. And it does come out at the end. But the fact that Lugosi is able to put that in his performance while still being basically the hero who's trying to save the girl, I think speaks to the quality and, and level of his acting. I think there's two reasons why you see him as evil as he is at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. The first, obviously, is, is how far Karloff's character pushes him. I mean... Basically, he stole his wife, then stole his daughter. That's one reason he's as evil as he is at the, film, at the end of the film. But I really think the other thing, and it's something that I don't hear too many people talk about, and it's something that, even though we did see it in the um, special features mentioned, but it's something that I picked up on the first time I watched it, is how both characters are really suffering from post-traumatic stress after World War I. And how they handle it is completely different. One thing I've always wondered while watching this film was Karloff's character as sadist before the film, before the war, excuse me, mm -hmm. or did the war drive him to that? You know... While you were just saying, you know, this talks about the PTSD, and they weren't calling it PTSD right. at that point. I don't know what they were calling it, if they were addressing it at all at that point. I don't know my history enough to know. Um, but as you were saying that, it made me wonder, how did Lugosi deal with the horrors of the war? How did Karloff and what Karloff experienced in the war, did that drive him to the satanic group, the his beliefs, what he's involved with? I don't know. Um I'd be interested to learn more about it. My personal feeling is, yes, that's probably what drove him because he had the opportunity to inflict a lot of pain on people in the war and found out that he kind of liked it. Ah, OK. And kind of went off on that satanic uh, kick. But <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. That old satanic kick. But Lugosi, I think... Yeah, he had the horrors of war and having to deal with that, but then on top of that, losing his family and not the way that you normally think of losing a family in the war. He, that's not, it was taken from him. It wasn't, they weren't killed by the war. They were still around, and he knew that because he was trying to track them down, and I think that drove him a little mad. There's a, a level of class and sophistication to the universal horrors of the 30s that I think gets a little lost once you get into the 40s, once you get past that. I like the 40s uh, universal horror, and I love the 50s. And I, I love it. And we all know my thing about Creature. I love Creature from the Black Lagoon, favorite film of all time. That said, it's hard to read much more into Creature than we've already done. You know? Yeah. Whereas with the Black Cat, Frankenstein, Dracula, Murders in the Room, Morgue, The Mummy, The Old Dark House... There, there are a lot of things happening in these films that we could just go on and on and on and, and explore and talk about and dive into. There's just something deeper 
about these films that, that resonates, I feel like. And the Black Cat's one that just now talking about the pre-PTSD diagnosis and how these people dealt with things. One goes on a satanic kick and the other one... Isn't that Lugosi's profession is? Isn't he a psychologist? Yeah. So, Maybe. yeah. Heal thyself didn't work. <laughs> it didn't take. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the performances, the characters are so deep. There's so much there. And it, it's something that I think fits in well with this film because there's also so much on the production level. This movie looks amazing. Oh, it's uh, yes. It's gorgeous. It looks ahead of its time. It, it does. does not look like it was made in the 30s. When we were watching it this time, there's a scene in the main room in the house. And I think some of the characters were walking toward the front door like they're going to leave or they're going to answer the door or whatever. And I'm noticing that the ceiling, which you see a lot of ceilings in this film, which I don't think you see a lot of in a lot of sets. And it actually feels like a room as opposed to a set and a soundstage somewhere. And some of the panels in the ceiling look like they're lit by fluorescent lights. Now, I know they're not, but it looks like it they does. are. And at that point, Scott says, this movie's ahead of its time. It's like, you're right, because they got fluorescent lights, but they don't. But that looks like it. And it, yeah, it's the Art Deco style, yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, it, it looks like a living room of a doctor or somebody well off from the 50s. Yeah. Karloff's house that he's built. Well, Ulmer himself did the art direction. Uh, Edgar G. Ulmer, the director of the film, who is an amazing director. And it really is a shame that this is kind of like the pinnacle and some things that he did off camera <laughs> uh, kind of blacklisted him from a lot of higher end productions because his vision, the design in this is just phenomenal. This film is just gorgeous to look at. Even if you don't pay attention to the story, and, and I'm not talking about just that one room that I've mentioned earlier, when you get down into the sub-basement oh, areas yes. of this former military base, they're incredible. And, and the way that they look, and even down to the satanic area where the uh, altar is and everything, has such a unique look. It's something that you don't normally even see in other satanic films. The way the the women are suspended yes. in those glass coffins. Yes. Creepy, but kind of gorgeous in a, in a really dark way. Uh, the area where they're doing the ceremony with the, not really crosses, but kind of on the side yeah. tilted. Just, yeah, there's just something that's just, it looks so good. It's not the same kind of set design that you'd see in like a Frankenstein or Dracula picture, oh, no. which are also good, but you know, you think Frankenstein and as awesome as it is to kind of see these stylized scenes at the graveyard, you know, that backdrop is just painted. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about these sets that are constructed in such a way that it looks like a real house. It does yeah. not look like a set A house. I'd love to live in. I mean, I, I'd hang out in that basement. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> have a bunch of women hung up in coffins. I'm going to say, if you're going to, I don't know if we're coming back here next Christmas if you're living in a place <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, I'd light it differently. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I would hate to go down there and see like Tracy and Bren hanging around. That would just not be a good place. <laughs> <laughs> Every shot in this film, you could pull a still frame from and it's art put on the wall. Oh, yeah. I love the, uh, the staircase going upstairs, that back wall. Mm -hmm. Anytime they're doing something on that, I mean, that's one of my favorite shots from that film. I used to, back when I had a job when I was working and I was sitting at my desk, I'd have a, a, a digital picture frame. And no, I'm not a normal person who would put like pictures of my family or whatever in a digital picture frame. Instead, it was movie posters <laughs> <laughs> and still shots from various monster movies and things like that, just kind of rotating through throughout the day. And I had a lot of shots from the black cat from that staircase with Lugosi standing on that staircase in profile. It just, it's a stunning image. Well, that whole set, and I think we, we talked about this a little bit because yeah. we, we actually went out and looked and IMDB and one of its trivia pieces say that that set piece cost the makers $1,500 to make, but that was in 1934 dollars. 
So, of course, we had to go out and I found uh, one of those inflation calculators to find out how much that would cost today. And $1,500 in 34 in 2020 is $28,791.94. So if you're going to build that, you need like <laughs> thirty grand to build this place. <laughs> yeah. And that's not including all the sub... This is just that wall and staircase. Yeah. As much as we love that staircase, though, I think you and I are in agreement here. In the best scenes in the film is when they're playing chess. Definitely. I, I kind of want to watch a movie of them playing chess. <laughs> you know, I, something like Searching for Bobby Fischer, just to have Karloff and Lugosi playing chess and just discussing. Can you imagine them sitting at a table playing chess, discussing their chess, discussing their careers with each other? I would watch the hell out of that film. <laughs> 75 minutes of them playing chess. I'm in. I'm in. I'll it would be that. a good game. It, it's a very good game, <laughs> to, to quote the film a couple of times. There is some promotional material that was released uh, with these two, where they are sitting there <laughs> playing chess. Uh, you know, your move, Dracula. Are you sure, Frank? I don't remember the exact lines. I'll try to find the audio and play it here. But it, it's just cool to see them against each other in that s- setup. And the stakes are so high in this particular game in the film. Mm-hmm. And, and you're rooting for Dracula. Yes. You want Dracula you are, to win. We yes, do, you do. What does that say about <laughs> what Lugosi is doing here? When you mentioned the promotional materials a second ago, I really thought you were going to mention what's on the Blu-ray. Oh, boy. <laughs> Supposedly, there was a contest at the time for people to bring their black cats to the studio for placement in the film. I guess. <laughs> and... It's silent. There's no audio to it. It shows, oh, probably 50, 60 kids <laughs> carrying black cats. And, and I looked at Derek when we were watching it, and I thought, it's children of the damned bringing their cats to... <laughs> None of them look happy. They no. all look terrified. And it's because Lagosi and Karloff are there. They're all in a line walking past them. And isn't Karloff in makeup, in yes. character for the black yeah, cats? So- he's in that... Um, robe thing yeah. that he wears the whole movie <laughs> these kids are just like bringing these cats who want to be anywhere but there yes and Lugosi's leaning over and smiling is like dude stop looking at my cat that way <laughs> i would love to have that robe that karloff wears it's my second favorite movie robe of all time it doesn't survive the, the movie no but i can imagine just sitting in front of the fire wearing that just kind of looking over the top of my glasses at somebody it would probably freak somebody out <laughs> yeah it's my second favorite movie robe you know what my first is um what is your first what do you think I want, I want a monos robe so bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say it's it, yeah i would want one of those two either that or bond's terry cloth robe from goldfinger <laughs> <laughs> i like it i like it all right so if we were going to have a monster kid Hall of Fame, a movie Hall of Fame of robes, those are the three robes that would be on it. Well, I don't see how Bond fits in the monster Well, I'm saying of- classic movie stuff. Okay, classic ones, okay. But yeah, but for monsters, <laughs> we're going to have, have the master's robe and Karloff's robe. Man, somebody's rolling in their grave right now. I don't know who, but <laughs> wow. That said, uh, speaking of the robe, though, the costume design is good. Everything in this movie is just spot on. There's nothing about this movie that I dislike. I don't know why I don't talk about it more because there's so much in it that's just so. Somebody on a message board said I use the word amazing way too much on this show, but it's amazing. For me, I think what weak points that I would bring out about this film Mm -hmm. is the rest of the cast. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the rest of the cast. They're so just there. They are just kind of there. It's David Manners and Julie Bishop are the, the young couple who just got married, probably on their way to their honeymoon, right? Yes. Why Why do you go to Eastern Europe for your honeymoon uh, in the 30s? Because they're American. I mean, he's a mystery author. Yeah, maybe that's why. Inspiration. Inspiration. Why? Well, well, he did, be a tax he did get He did get inspired because he wrote that, <laughs> you know, at the very last scene, you find out that he wrote so now I'm wondering, was it all real? Or was the whole movie just him telling this story that he wrote? Huh. <laughs> Is the black cat a Peter Allison story? 
Or is it an Edgar Allan Poe story? It's not. It's, <laughs> you man. They say it is. <laughs> Even going back to the 1930s, they were using Poe's name to promote a film that really had nothing to do with Poe. Again, talked about it on the show in the past. Poe's name being used in The Haunted Palace, even though it's a Lovecraft film, just to kind of promote the film and get more people, get more butts in the seat because they know Poe. Again, this was, and even the title card on the screen, suggested by a story by Edgar Allan Poe. I, I hope his Literary estate yeah. <laughs> got something. Yeah, at that point, he probably wasn't in the public domain, huh? It was the 30s. Yeah. Huh. But going anyway, back to the rest anyway, yeah. Going back to the rest of the cast, I'm not impressed with anybody else. But then again, they don't need to be because Karloff and Lugosi are so good. I kind of like the, uh, I don't know what you call them, the seconds, I suppose, the the, the uh, helper assistant types, the as they're called in the credits, the Major Domo and Thamal, who I guess is Lugosi's. Do they speak? I don't think they speak. Well, actually, I think the Major Domo does, because he says something about the car being needed to be repaired. Oh, yes, that's right. The car's out, which leads up to the scene to where even the phone is dead. No, I love oh. that. I love that reading, though. Even the phone is dead. You hear that, Vitas? <laughs> even the phone is dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's hard to really stand out when you've got these they're, powerhouses. They're adequate. I'm not saying they're bad. Yeah, they're, they're adequate bad. for the film. And I think David Manners sometimes gets a bad rap. He, he's just kind of this bland vanilla guy yeah. that turns up in a lot of these movies. Uh, he was also in The Mummy. He was in Dracula. Uh, he was in The Death Kiss with Bela Lugosi, which I actually really like. But he's just kind of bland. He's just kind of there. I mean, even in Dracula, what is he? Is he Harker in that? He's Harker in that. How mm -hmm. do you? I kind of like him. I want to know more about the guy. As I watch more watch his performances over and over again, I kind of see a little bit more about what he's doing. But again... It's Karloff and Lugosi. How do you stand up to these two icons in their prime? Well, even watching this film, if you if you don't look at anything else that anybody in the film did, if you ask me who I would like to learn more about, mm -hmm. it's Lugosi and Karloff's character. Oh, yeah. I don't I don't need to know anything else about anybody else in this film. Sure. I would love I could I could go easily with a prequel to this film. With their actions in the war. Oh man, a World War One film with these two? What yes. they did? What, what oh they, gosh! And how they had the their internal struggles over the uh, Lugosi's wife. Oh man! I could imagine that the chess game we see in this film was not the first one. Yeah. No. Wow. You know, there's a question in the classic five: what monster movie needs a prequel? This is it. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see more Gilman. I'd love to see more stuff with Pretorius, but this, this is the one. Yeah. Because you're right. Yeah, a World War One film and. Universal did war epics, did war films. I, I would love to see it. And it doesn't even need to be an epic. It, just focusing on just those two, they're th these two. two. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That'd be cool. But of course, the fan fiction part of my brain, which is there, I'll admit, I don't do a lot with it. Once more, Peter Allison's story. <laughs> just going around <laughs> writing all these stories that happen to take place with, yeah. Because I, I like the idea that maybe this isn't something that really happened. Maybe this is Peter Allison's take on or or just a story that he wrote yep i like that a lot it's not the only literary influence here i didn't realize i didn't remember it took place it opens on the orient express yep i didn't remember that so I, th there's that as well so agatha christie wrote this yeah yes <laughs> well so when allison is reading his review of his most recent story in the newspaper they say it's not that great it's kind of derivative that sort of thing placing it on or starting it on the Orient Express would be something a kind of hack writer would do because he's aping off of Agatha Christie. So maybe, hey, <laughs> now there's some levels to explore here, man. I had also forgotten, speaking of things I've forgotten, I had forgotten about how pervasive the music is through this entire thing. Uh, weren't you saying that this is pretty much the first time Universal had a continuous soundtrack from that was start to finish? That was another thing that I read. This was one of the first movies that had basically a score that was using music all the way through. As much as I love Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy murders in the room morgue. And the mummy's got some Frankenstein's got some Dracula's pretty bereft of music. It's just not a lot of film score stuff. And I love my film scores. People know that uh, at this point, there's just something 
magical about a good film score. And not that the music in this was originally written for this film, because it's almost Romeo and Juliet over and over and over again. Yeah, that that's the one knock I would give on the score is it's like one song over and over and over, except for Kata and Fugue or something like that that's at the end. The piece that he plays on the organ. Right. Which feels very Phantom of the Opera. Yes. Which is right in their wheelhouse. But the um, Romeo and Juliet music, they keep using it over and over and over again. Yeah. It's, it's like they got tired of using Swan Lake over and over again. So then they, <laughs> which they use in Dracula and the Mummy. So then they're, ah, let's use the Romeo and Juliet music. Yeah. And there's some other pieces here and there, but it's pretty nonstop. Yeah. Which would be something a hack author would do if it's a Peter Allison story. There you I go. <laughs> I am liking that theory more and more. Yeah. <laughs> there are a couple black cats that turn up. Um, terrible things happen. And I have never seen anybody that deathly afraid of house cats. Maybe something happened in World War One. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I, if we had a prequel, I would want to know why he is so afraid. I, I have this theory in my mind that something happened to him as a little boy where a cat did something scratched him or scratched a brother or something that traumatized him as a little boy yeah for him to be as scared to the the fact that the first thing you think of when you see a cat is to throw a knife at it and kill it and kill it so here we are saying Lugosi is a sympathetic character and a hero dude killed a cat I'm not down with that that's true you don't see it. I mean, no, you no, don't. It's nothing like that. But you, you, but nobody reacts to it. Like, no. if somebody did that in front of me and be, what the hell? Out of my house. Yeah, especially the owner of the cat, Karloff, uh-huh. witnesses it, and he barely even reacts. Yeah. Now I'm angry at Lugosi's character. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, it the, was a stunt cat. It really didn't happen. <laughs> well, it all happened off screen. I know, I know. Yep. Um, they had to put the black cat in there somewhere. To make it a Poe film. <laughs> I mean, and the cat that well, must have been another one because it cat shows back up later in the film. It scares Lugosi through a glass wall. In the Poe film about the black cat, it, it's it's something that keeps turning back up, right? <laughs> Wednesday is giving Scott a look. <laughs> it's like, you're talking about cats? You're talking about me. We're just staring at her. Anyway. <laughs> This is the part of the podcast where we all acknowledge that Wednesday is staring at us. Anyway, in the Poe film, the black cat keeps coming back, coming back, coming back, which we do see a black cat more than once in this film. Is it the same black cat coming back? Is it something magical, spooky, satanic, whatever? Is it a real cat? Is it something pulsing? Karloff's character's doing? Who knows? Well, there is the, the one line about, because the um, the object, the girl, and the, it shows up about the same time the cat gets killed oh, yeah and he makes that comment about evil spirits and the cat and showing up but th- th- that's never brought back up when the cats show up I-, I think the cat stuff is just really superfluous which kind of happened to when they did the raven which is supposed to be based on a post story as well it's just kind of there it's not really inspired by the story have you seen the raven yes we talked a little bit about that i guess while we were watching it because uh, you were mentioning with all the sliding doors, that one, room, yeah. that one room that it was reminding you of the Raven. And I said, it's because of the trap doors. Yeah. At least in the Raven, though, they actually reference Poe. They actually say, I really like Poe. You know, <laughs> suppose there's no reference here at all. <laughs> that was part of Poe's suggestion. Don't mention me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew Lugosi was a big guy. Seeing him next to Karloff, though, I guess I always pictured Karloff as being a big, tall dude because he's Frankenstein's monster. He's got to be right. a tall guy. I know he's got big lifts in his shoes, but still, Lugosi is a bigger dude. He's a tall guy, and I know he's got to be a bigger presence because he's Dracula. You know, he's this big monster dude, but he's a tall guy. I don't know how tall he was in real life, but he feels bigger to me. In what what always gets me about this film and his size is there's a scene near the end where his shirt is ripped off and you see yeah. Karloff without a shirt on uh-huh. and he looks small uh-huh. because I'm thinking he's Frankenstein or he's Frankenstein's monster for those out there that go that way. <laughs> but Frankenstein's monster is a tree trunk. He's a big guy. 
And when I see Karloff without the shirt on, he almost looks gaunt. It's kind of unnerving. Yes. It's not something you, you would expect to see. And that, of course, goes soon. I've told this story on the show before, that sequence. I started giggling when we were watching the movie. <laughs> yes, he did. I was hoping he was going to bring this up on the show. I, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but that that scene I can't see without thinking about the time I talked to Sarah Karloff. And I told her The Black Cat's one of my favorite Karloff films. Oh, so you like seeing my father get skinned alive, huh? Well, <laughs> it's not exactly where I was going, but okay. <laughs> That was yeah. that's that's another thing about how gaunt Karloff looks. He also looks like he's pale white, like he's not seen the sun in years. Well, a lot of I mean, it's makeup. Obviously, I know it's but, makeup, but that's Jack Pierce's makeup. Yeah, doing more than just caking a bunch of not necessarily prosthetics, but like collodion and cotton and all that to build up the wrinkles on head. Pierce was a master makeup artist. He didn't just do the extreme monster stuff. He would do things like that. And he was really good at it. Yeah. It makes me think of, and I don't know why my mind goes this way. It's probably what was intended. But yeah, he's a satanic cultist. He does all his stuff at night. He's not out during the day. He spends a lot of time in the basement looking at women in glass coffins. That's true, too. He's not getting a lot of sunlight. You're right. (laughs) Yeah, he's he's a creature of the night, ironically. Exactly. Considering who he's up against in this film. <laughs> I think the film deserves multiple rewatches. Uh, you could really learn a lot more about it and come away from the film appreciating it even more. Like you said, the, the Peter Allison connection potentially. Uh, just imagining what would have happened during World War II, how that whole relationship started. I'd like to imagine that maybe they'd be even friends. Like they were close before the war started. Yeah, I, I I believe that too. And the other thing that I also, while we were watching some of the extra stuff on this film, mm-hmm. was talking about how the studio asked for reshoots and everything because they were a little worried of how intense the film was. And then when I watched the film, there's no gore. There's no, I mean, it's all implied. Everything's implied and... If it came out today, would it even get an R rating? Man, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe the subject matter, but still, I don't know. I mean, the MPAA is still fairly conservative. I feel like it's gotten a little better over the years, but how if, it, they... if it gets an R, it's because of the subject matter. It's yeah. not because of what's on the screen. True, true. I would agree with you there. There, There's a little bit of blood, but it's from people getting hit in the mouth. Yeah. People are getting shot and stabbed, but you don't see that. Somebody gets punched in the face and their mouth bleeds. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> dies in a car accident. You don't see him. No, not at all. And that's that's okay. I mean, I'm sure part of it was also technical ability. Oh, yeah. You don't have a lot of explosive squibs and things like that back then to, to create bullet hits or whatever, but... I'm, I was watching the end of it yesterday when we were watching this, and I'm thinking to myself that this was remade today, and you got a Nicotero or somebody like that, you would have seen more of that skinning scene. Oh, yeah. And I don't need it. The way no. it's The way it's presented in this film is perfect. There's a couple of uh, scenes that you see in silhouette, and that's all you need. Your mind makes up the parts that aren't shown and my mind was doing it's well on its own. (laughs) Well, yeah. And you talk about the silhouette. There's so much shadow work here. Ulmer really knew how to paint with shadows. I know we talk about Val Luton being the master of shadows and the first film that we did during the satanic rites of January, uh, the seventh victim is a Val Luton film and you see a lot with shadow. Ulmer also really knew how to use shadows and silhouettes and all that in this film. And you're right. You mentioned Nicotero. We're talking about the MPAA and issues, whatever that they've had over the years. Tarantino. Yeah. Used Nicotero to do special effects in Reservoir Dogs. And in Reservoir Dogs, there's a scene where the guy cuts the dude's ear, the dude's ear off. Yep. And my understanding is that that was actually shot. You actually did see the ear come off. But for whatever reason, either Tarantino made this choice or the MPAA made him make this choice where instead of actually seeing the dude cut his ear off, I've used the word dude a lot today, (laughs) seeing the dude cut the ear off as opposed to the camera kind of pulling away as he's doing it and you just hear it, that's scarier. Mm -hmm. 
instead of actually seeing it happen. And I think that's what this film also does. Instead of seeing the actual skinning, you see the look in Lugosi's face. Have you ever seen an animal skinned alive? That's what I'm going to do to you, you know, and you see that. And then you, you just imagine what it sounds like and what's happening is you see the shadows playing against the wall. It's, uh, uh, it's terrifying. Well, there is one other silhouette scene that I want to mention, and it's the first time that we see Karloff in this film. Yeah. He's he's in bed. Mm-hmm. And oh, there's... Oh, man. <laughs> That's creepy. The way he rises from the bed reminds... I mean, he, I'm sure it's done on purpose, but it looks like Frankenstein rising from the operating table. Yeah. And with the silhouette of... Karloff there, it really looks like Frankenstein's monster. And I'm sure that was done on purpose. Oh, sure. Sure. But the way it's done, the way it's directed, there's a lot of reasons why this movie is so good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the direction, the performances, the, the design. It's one that I'm surprised isn't as mentioned as much when you talk about classic universal yeah. monster films. or actually classic universal horror films, this one doesn't get its due and it surprises me. And I wonder how much of that was universal, maybe suppressing it after what happened with Ulmer and his dalliance with a married woman who's related to one of the Lemleys. You've got that in the whole satanic part of this film. It's not something that they maybe wanted to promote too much. And in 1941, they released another movie called The Black Cat that is nothing like this whatsoever, who also starred Lugosi. So there might be some confusion there, too, when you look back at it. I know I, every time this movie comes up on the show, I go looking for a trailer for it because I want to play the trailer audio. Mm-hmm. There's no surviving trailer to The Black Cat that I'm able to find. And some people on YouTube have actually posted, here's the official trailer for The Black Cat, 1934, and it's the 1941 one. So there might be some confusion there, too. I don't know. But I think it does deserve some more attention. And, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you liked it so much. That's why I've been sitting on it for so long. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about it. And happy accident that you happen to be here in Portland to talk about it for the Satanic Rites of January. I mean, this this is one of the films that and, I've been and I had to pod- and I had to podcast with you to work off the fact that I'm staying here with you. So well, there's that plus some other things we'll talk about off mic. <laughs> yes, Brendan and I had a nice long talk last night about what you and Tracy owe, especially Tracy, and uh, <laughs> you know we're just just saying. I don't know if anybody heard that, but my wife just wandered into the room, said, "Gird your loins." I'm waiting for her to just leave now after saying that because that would be even creepier. <laughs> Gird your loins. Exit stage left. <laughs> What else do we want to say about The Black Cat before we wrap up? We've been chatting here for about an hour. I definitely see this film. Yes. If you have not seen this film, track it down. Make sure you get the 34 version, not the 41 version. Which I don't think I've ever seen, actually, now that I think about it. So it might be great, too, but this one. This, this one. one, yes. I, I don't think uh, Karloff is in the 41 version. So No, no, he's not. And, and he's my favorite in the film. I love Lugosi in this film. But there's just something about the way Karloff carries himself. He's my favorite in this film. Karloff is such a unique character in this movie. I'm always going to be drawn toward Lugosi, and I think it's because I feel like he doesn't get his due. Maybe that's part of it. But I will never, ever deny what Karloff can do and bring to the screen. It's amazing. And whether you're Team Lugosi, Team Karloff, I think the best scenes in this film are when they're in the scene together. And I don't think I ever want to meet Sarah Karloff. <laughs> because she would not like my two favorite Karloff films. What's the other one? Targets. Oh, actually, she likes Targets. I think she likes Targets, which is also a phenomenal movie, which someday we'll talk about here on the show, maybe, because it's got some monster kid stuff basil rathbone is the other guy in lugosi the other dude to go back to the word of the day yes which yeah i don't think i have seen that black cat but it looks like an old dark house type movie but yeah make sure you get the 34 version it's well worth the um time it takes to find it and if you really are interested check out the um scream factory 
Blu-ray because it looked amazing. It's so good. Uh, whether it's called the Black Cat or what did you say it was called over in the UK? House of Doom? House of Doom. Because Black Cats are not necessarily bad luck over in the UK, I, I guess. Yeah, they actually think they're good luck. Yeah, I, I prefer the title The Black Cat. I think it works perfectly despite having nothing to do with the, the story. Highly recommended. Disney Indiana approves the satanic film. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes we do. <laughs> wow. Okay, so it's 2020. It is early 2020. It's January 1st. Do you know what you're doing on Disney Indiana the rest of the year? You got any themes lined, lined up? I do, but we haven't announced it on our show yet. So oh, I okay. would point, I'm going to sit on it and not say we do have another yearly celebration. Uh, we just wrapped up comparing specific attractions that could be found both in Disneyland and Walt Disney World and saying which one is our favorite. We do have another cross-country type of uh, celebration that we're going to start here in January and run as a monthly segment, but I am going to hold off on that announcement until our show. Okay, Scott, you can sit on it, and uh, uh, there are plans like we talked about at the beginning about doing some crossovers some collaborations between mkr and di doing hopefully the black hole or blackbeard's ghost or the black cauldron the black cauldron we keep talking about too man we keep dancing around it has to have black in the title <laughs> it really does maybe that should be our theme this year. well no that's going to blow flashback february yes it's true unless it's about castle meat black it's time <laughs> oh why doesn't that exist <laughs> oh man or Blackula. Oh, God. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. That's what I want. Oh, boy. And we're about to go off the rails again. So let's wrap up. DisneyIndiana.com is where you can find Scott and his lovely wife, Tracy. The real star of the show. She's in the room. <laughs> I always say this, and I said it recently on the show. Favorite Disney podcast. You guys just hit 300 episodes, which is amazing. Uh, I gushed about it a couple weeks ago here on the show. Uh, that you hit that mark is fantastic. Uh, over a decade of Disney Indiana goodness. So yep. congratulations on that. Listeners, check it out. There is a permalink at monsterkidradio.net. Just look in the links section. You're going to find a link to Disney Indiana. Go check it out. And if you find yourself on Disney Indiana, we have a link to Monster Kid Radio over there. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Scott and Tracy have been super supportive of me on a podcasting level and a personal level for years. So if nothing else, if you like what I do here on MKR, part of it is because I've got people like Scott and Tracy having my back and the podcast back. So check them out. If nothing else, uh, do it for me, man. Do it for me. Do it for you. Do it for the mouse because they need more money. Obviously. That's right. They got to buy Universal. Remember? <laughs> as long as they don't, as long as they don't buy your podcast. Actually, if they buy your podcast, that'd be good for you. Yeah, it'd so. be really good for me. Yeah, it's for sale, Disney. Come talk to us. <laughs> I am so proud of Scott Morris and his wife Tracy Morris for what they've done with Disney Indiana. They have been going for over a decade producing that show nonstop. It's incredible and quite the feat. And Scott has become a very dear friend over the years and that he and his wife came out to well, our home for the holidays and spend the holidays with us and then even allowed us to sneak in some podcasting time. I mean, that's just gravy so thank you to scott and tracy for coming out thank you to scott for being part of the show this time around i'm so glad that we were able to get the disney podcaster into the satanic rites of january <laughs> as he was talking about though you'll hear him again next month during flashback february when he returns to the show to talk about returning film abbott and costello meet frankenstein of course you can find scott and tracy over at disney indiana Dot com. They're also on Facebook. Lick them up. No, look them up and tell them that Monster Kid Radio sent you. <laughs> oh, and I know that I kept switching World War One and World War Two up in my conversation. I knew it was World War One, just World War Two was on my mind. I don't know why. Also, the promotional film that I was talking about with Karloff and Lugosi playing chess against each other, that was not for the Black Cat. I don't know why I associated it with the Black Cat. It actually came along um, further on after a few of collaborations between Karloff and Lugosi. It's still cool. And it still sounds like this. 
It is an historic occasion whenever Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi confront each other. Their very presence weaves a spell of mystery and horror. Ready for the test, Dracula? I'm ready, Frankenstein. Then let us begin. <laughs> You understand, Baylor, don't you? That the one who wins this little game of chess is to lead the parade at the film star's frolic. Okay, Boris. You'll move. Right. The fear of the year is here. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde, a monster he could not control, have taken over his very soul. A screaming demon rages inside, turning him into Mr. Hyde, an unstoppable black superman. Super strong, supernatural, and super bad. His punch can topple a skyscraper. His kick can split the earth in two. More destructive than an earthquake. Mightier than a tidal wave. A one-man disaster area. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde, when you're seeing what ain't, you're looking at a haint. Shot full of lead and he still ain't dead. Jump back, Jack, for your skull is cracked. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde, starring Bernie Casey, Rosalind Cash, Stu Gillum, directed by William Blackula Crane. Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde. Rated R. Under 17. Not admitted without parents. So bring your mama. She'll like it too. The mark of the devil is deadly. <laughs> the devil's nightmare will leave its mark on you. Rated R. That brings us to the end of yet another episode of Monster Kid Radio. Thanks for listening. If you are a social media user, please consider retweeting the tweets from Monster Kid Radio, sharing the posts on Facebook, just letting everybody know about your maybe favorite classic monster movie podcast. The more listeners we have, the merrier. And if you are on Facebook and you haven't given us a like yet, please consider liking Monster Kid Radio over there. Once again, I'd like to make a push to have Monster Kid Radio have a bigger presence on Facebook. No, I don't know what the algorithms are. No, I don't know what the benefits are to having however many likes you need on Facebook to get whatever. But the more likes, I think, the better. That's how it works, right? Can we hit 2,000 likes by the end of 2020? With your help, we might be able to pull that off. The Monster Kid Radio Twitter account is used by the podcast, but also used by me. So if you want to be in touch with me between episodes or just kind of touch base or whatever, and you're a Twitter user, feel free to tweet me. Just find me at Monster Kid Radio over there. At monsterkidradio.net, though, that's where you're going to find everything else you need to know about Monster Kid Radio, including our contact information. If you wanted to shoot us an email, you can do so by emailing me at monsterkidradio at gmail.com, or you can call and leave us a voicemail at 503-479-5657. That's 503-479-5MKR. If there are any events coming up in your neck of the woods that you'd like to share with Monster Kid Radio listeners, feel free to send that in too, and I'll spotlight it here on the show. I was speaking with returning guest Alistair Hughes just the other day when we were recording for an upcoming episode, and we talked about how great social media has been for connecting all of us Monster Kids and getting us together. But there's one thing better than this, and that's meeting in person. So if there's something happening in your area that you think Monster Kids would dig, I want to hear about it so we can make sure everybody else here's about it. Of course, in the show notes of this episode and every episode, you're going to find links to everything that we talked about in that episode, including links to Amazon, because we are an Amazon affiliate. If there's anything that you've heard about on the show that's available for sale through Amazon, I'll make sure there's a button in the show notes over at monsterkidradio.net that you can click on and follow and go to Amazon and buy it that way. Because if you do that, because we're an affiliate, you're helping the show out and every little bit helps. And I really appreciate all of your support. If nothing else, if you need to buy a copy of my book, Monster Hunter for Hire, please consider using the link over at monsterkidradio.net in the show notes again, because not only do I get a commission off the book, but then I also get the affiliate sale bump, which I know is only a couple of cents, but still every little bit helps. If you are a fellow podcaster, there is a section on the website where you can download any of the promos that you've heard on other podcasts about monster kid radio. There are four different ones. 
check them out, throw them into your podcast mix. And if you do, let me know because I'd love to return the favor. At the beginning of the show, I talked about Fandom PDX, the most recent convention that you saw Monster Kid Radio at. Where will Monster Kid Radio and where will I be next? If you're in the Portland, Oregon area, there is a real good chance you're going to find me at Wizard World Portland, which is happening January 24th through the 26th. Now, I typically only go one day unless there's like a panel or something going on. I'm not there in any official capacity yet. I don't think they've cut off submissions for panels, but might be cutting it pretty close. That said, I may be a panelist on somebody else's panel. David Heath, fingers and tentacles crossed, has a panel that he submitted. Hopefully it goes through and he's asked me to be a panelist with him. As soon as I know something, you'll know something. After that, I'm going across the country, kind of. I'm going like halfway. I'm going to Minnesota because on April 29th, it's the world premiere of the newest film from Christopher R. Mim. The movie is called The Phantom Lake Kids in The Beast Walks Among Us, and I'm going to be there. It's at the Historic Heights Theater. I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes to the Mimiverse's website, which is sainteuphoria.com, where you can go and buy tickets, learn a little bit more about the premiere, learn a little bit more about The Beast Walks Among Us and any of the other movies he's got in his catalog already or in various stages of production right now, including a really cool Christmas project that'll be coming up next year. If you're going to be attending the world premiere, let me know. I'd love to meet you. Of course, Monster Bash is happening later this year, but when we get closer to that, I'll talk a little bit more about Monster Kid Radio's involvement at the Bash. Are there any monster events happening near you that you think Monster Kid Radio should be at? Well, if it's something that I can get to or people can help me get to, I'd be happy to go. Or maybe you'd like to cover that event for Monster Kid Radio. Drop me a line. Again, monsterkidradio at gmail.com. I feel like I'm starting to ramble, so let me tell you a little bit about what's happening next week during week three of the Satanic Rites of January. Alistair Hughes, the artist, the author, the man from New Zealand. He is the man behind the incredible book, Info Gothic. If you don't have Info Gothic, you gotta check it out. And yeah, there is an Amazon affiliate link for that as well. He is coming to the show, and we're going to be talking about a film that actually inspired this month's theme. It's happening right now in London. New York could be next. Or Paris, or Rome, or Tokyo. It's happening right now to this girl. Perhaps it's your turn next. We are not dealing with ordinary criminals. The real force is more sinister, more obscene than any monstrosity you can think of. Lord of corruption, master of the undead, Count Dracula. If you follow me on Facebook, you saw that I posted something about being unreasonably in love with this film. And spoiler alert, yeah. I love this film. So does Al. And we're going to talk about that next week on the show. If you've not seen The Satanic Rites of Dracula yet, you got seven days to get caught up or buy the Blu-ray from Amazon. Link in the show notes. You know the deal by now. Also next week, we'll have another surf band on the show. That surf band will be House of Man. They're based out of Detroit, Michigan. Come back to hear how they sound. If nothing else, come back next week to hear them. Although you don't want to miss Al or Professor Frenzy, or Kenny's Look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, or anything else that comes up next week on the podcast. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution. Non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0, unported license. Professor Frenzy's bedtime story is copyright 2020, Jerry Green. And the song, Horonado, that belongs to Mariachi Death Squad, which you can find over at mariachideathsquad.bandcamp.com. Check out the album you've been hit by, and you can pick it up for five bucks. You can buy the entire digital album. I mean, that's a deal. Go check them out. Let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name's Derek M. Cook. Talk to everybody next week. Thanks for listening. Ciao.